Hi all, I have another fascinating game to show you from TSEC Season 19. So the two big giants of the tournament so far seem to be Stockfish NN and Leela. They're in the lead at the moment. This is Stockfish against Ethereal in round 20. So Stockfish playing with the white pieces. We have D4, D6. The opening territory set is the King's Engine Defense. The Orthodox variation. So with Knight BD7 quite often in modern King's Engine defenses, the Knight goes to C6 and a lot of variations. So here we have a classic start position anyway, C6. This is the end of the book. Stockfish gets a bit more space in the center with D5. Okay, are there corresponding weaknesses on dark squares? But is black in a position to really exploit that anyway? We have C takes, C takes, Knight C5, Queen C2, Queen C7. And now white has to be a bit careful protecting E4 with this move to protect e4 uh, for example if bishop e3 then knight c takes e4 because of the pinned knight so the knight gets extra protection i mean the knight affords extra protection bishop d7 and now a4 we have rook fc8 and now knight c4 which invites actually a tactical trick which simplifies the position a little bit it invites knight takes a4. If black doesn't do knight takes a4, before we get into it, uh, if h6, b3, just, this is just an example. White might be able to build something on the queen side later, for example, like this, where the a7 pawn in some scenarios is weak. So white could be getting an advantage in theory, uh, eventually taking on a7. If black does nothing, uh, and I know that featured a bit of the tactical trick anyway. It's a bit of a tricky position. Yeah, if we just recap. So white, if left to, to white's own accord, this bishop e3 and then tucking the bishop like this on this diagonal. It, it does seem a bit nasty for black in general. I mean, this, this would essentially prompt this trick anyway if white plays b4. So yeah, it's it's a sort of, it's a space advantage which may be, is accentuated once the bishop comes to e3. So maybe black is trying to pounce before this setup is more optimal. So knight takes a4. It's an interesting tactical transaction. Knight takes a4 and b5. So getting the piece back, b3, b takes, bishop takes c4, and now bishop b5. And we have here knight b2, reinforcing the c4 bishop, a6 h3 has has white actually achieved that much the thing is there's still this torturous you know semi-open foul here uh, we have rook ab8 bishop d2 queen b6 rook a3 as though uh well to a full you know protection on b3 sometimes is useful as well as to double rooks so we have uh queen the queen plunges in to d4 this seems like a very tempting uh forcing move to play queen d4 here um, so instead though uh, there might be the possibility i mean i looked at what if black didn't do this because this is kind of forcing in nature what if black played a weighted move like h6 i found something actually kind of interesting about the position that i'd like to share with you uh, say bishop e3 was allowed maybe this isn't entirely terrible for black with this uh, queen f8, with the idea of a strategic bishop exchange later, if black can in some cases get rid of the dark square bishops, white maybe is a bit more fragile. So say this happens, it's a strategic bishop exchange where the dark squares have been slightly weakened. It might become almost equal. It's just something I thought was fascinating uh, to consider. But it's not going to happen with a move like queen D4. This is more tactical in nature. It's not really with this idea of trying to exchange off, in some cases, the bishop. In fact, the bishops are interesting in this game. It's like this bishop wants to make a mockery of of the opposing bishop, getting it to do pointless work, just work for its own sake on the dark squares, as we'll see uh, soon, actually. So bishop c1. And the bishop, for the moment, is kind of hemmed in by its own pawns and has to sort of zigzag out of this pawn chain if it wants to get some life here. 
So this bishop is more lively for sure in this structure right now than the opposing bishop. We have king h2, queen c5, rook a2, yeah the rook was hit, knight d7, bishop e3 now, queen c7, rook c1, queen b7, knight d3, it looks like a nice centralizing move. Uh, we have knight b6, knight b2, knight d7, knight a4, bishop e7, Okay, so the bishop is kind of wriggling out a bit. Queen e2, bishop d8, so wriggle, wriggle for that bishop. But now, because the bishop has left, I mean, it's, this bishop's really making fun of the opposing bishop because it's left the king. It's actually uh, bishop h6 is played now. We have bishop takes c4. Uh, just an example why, why this kind of forcing move wasn't necessary. I expect if king h8, white is better anyway after bishop takes and knight b2. It looks as though, this is just a fictional scenario, it looks as though white might be uh, getting a nice position, for example, like this. And maybe some invasion point on c6 later could be handy for white. For example, like this, leaves white with a nice advantage and a dangerous pass pawn. Uh, and this acts kind of like a form pawn bishop, <laughs> form bishop. There. So anyway, uh, we have bishop takes c4, b takes a5, rook b2, queen a7, and now bishop e3, rook takes b2, queen takes b2, uh, queen b8. And here is an interesting decision point. Stockfish further allows simplification with queen b5. It wants to get a dangerous pass pawn, clearly. So kind of converting the space advantage into a pass pawn. But is that enough to win the game here? Uh, we see queen takes b5 being played, going in with that transaction. If knight f8 instead, maybe queen a6, and this situation with bishop a7 starts to be a bit unpleasant. If queen c7, you know, you don't want to allow knight b6 uh, on queen a8, then it starts to get a bit nasty actually. For example, like this, and ouch. So maybe this is kind of com you know compelling the queen exchange. So White's forcibly got a dangerous pass pawn, and the rooks uh, come off because otherwise it's just going to invade. Maybe on c6 looks tasty at some points. It it looks uh, dangerous to allow that rook on the c file. So rook takes, bishop takes, and we have f5. Here, instead of f5, which looks like an active move, if knight b6, knight takes, this with bishop e3 is dangerous, actually, uh, because this pass pawn is a little bit quicker than the a5 pawn. So, for example, like this is a very dangerous position where I believe white's able to win this endgame configuration. White's slightly better here, for example, like this, puncturing a hole to get in with the king. So that kind of scenario is a bit of a nightmare. So we have here um, f5. So not knight b6, because that would invite that kind of thing. Just seen. So f5. Now here again, this bishop is like mocking its counterpart with this next move, in a way. It, it seizes that diagonal to stop the use of b6 so much, and sometimes threatening bishop a7 to kind of herd the pawn through uh, along with the knight. So it looks dangerous but black does take on e4. Uh, just to show f4, bishop a7, it's, it is dangerous here this effect because uh, for example like this where after knight b5 it's, it's getting a bit scary for black. Uh, for example, like this, it's it's actually just better for white there. Uh, this end game, the prospects are with white. So f4, uh, and we look at this um, again. Instead of um, b7, I think b7 is is good. But and also even f3, this this scenario is also going to be good for white. If we look at this, this is. Yeah, it looks as though these scenarios are nice for white. white. The white king could get aggressive, for example, like this winning. So it is dangerous. So f takes e4 was tried. It, so technically a pawn up for black. 
but it's the quality of the pieces and it's the mockery of this bishop over that one uh, or maybe the knight's trying to mock that one as well it's the quality of the pieces of battle you know what who which pieces are higher quality uh, we have b6 king f8 uh, king g1 the king is also is that going to be trying to prove its superiority over the opponent's king as well this competition for all three bishop knight and king against each other to prove who is qualitatively better uh, if b7 was played there by the way uh, bishop c7 here and this you know white should have a small edge but I think this is more precise king g1 not to use up the b7 option just yet king e8 and now g4 we have knight b8 uh, here if g5 then for example this situation is unpleasant for black very unpleasant white's getting a big advantage so knight b8 we have bishop d2 knight d7 if here i mean the, the bishop's targeting the pawn so if king d7 this this is not going to be clever after b7 check for example it's going to be a disaster uh you know losing a5 is losing the game essentially just to be clear on that so knight d7 b7 knight b8 the king goes to f1 king e7 king e2 king d7 bishop e1 knight a6 king goes to d1 so the king is really heading over here uh, to try and do some damage so we see this king maneuvering up there and yeah this is a really interesting point after king b3 bishop h4 losing apparent patience so the bishop's trying to do something constructive on the dark squares uh, if it just stayed at home here with bishop e7 then you know a5 drops for example that so that's not possible but this is a tricky position for black there's also this kind of force field uh, for the king not being able to step on c6 uh, and c8 right now but we'll soon see that a5 is also joining the party here to try and keep this king out of any of these squares uh, so you know these squares we're going to see a force field kind of set up I like force fields from the old sci-fi stuff films and stuff and there was a series on TV which had force fields I think in the 80s 90s please let me know the TV series that you like that had force fields in the comments so anyway uh, we have Bishop H4 so I was going to show you something else as well so Bishop E7 is losing King E7 it allows white here to just bottle black up with g5 and h4 really making sure that bishop's not doing anything and the king can't really step across because the bishop takes a5 so it, the forceful is virtually there already and if this happens you know this is just uh going to be a disaster uh basically black's going to be in big trouble for example like this and bishop a5 winning so it is troublesome if black does nothing so this attempt to do something on the dark squares is made giving up the a5 pawn but now we have bishop takes f2 uh, king c4 bishop c5 knight c3 e3 and the bishop is in a bit of a passive role here it's what is it actually doing apart from holding a pawn okay it seems to be outside the pawn chain but it's not doing that much right now we have king d3 so the king steps back to firmly grasp black's pass pawn but you can see this force field has been set up for the king not being able to use the, the key squares here so this pass pawn uh, is dangerous okay so we have the bishop going to a7 and now king e2 h6 king f3 so the king's coming over here now bishop b8 and this relinquishes the b6 square by playing bishop b8 but things are getting a bit scary over here with the king uh, 
on this side. So bishop b6 uh, was was allowed. And now bishop c7, bishop a7, bishop b8. And now the bishops finally come off. But this end game after knight b5, white maintains that force field by keeping the king out of c7 with knight b5. And in fact, the king now proves itself better than its counterpart after g5. King takes e3, knight a6, king f3, knight b8, king e4, knight a6, king f5. The king uh, is able to come and get these pawns, and the knight is able to hop back if needed against this pawn. So the king's by no means tied down against this pawn here. And after e4, in fact, this is looking desperate. Yeah, black resigned with this move. So if the game continued, King takes e4, for example, check. The king goes back. Uh, and it doesn't matter about b7 being lost tactically there. This ends up as a winning knight and pawn ending, actually. It requires precision, but it is actually a winning knight and pawn ending. Uh, for example, like this is just one example uh, where black gets really tied down and drops d6 to be two pawns down. It becomes much clearer. It's a winning endgame. So I'll take you back to the uh, the game end position. So it's kind of a fascinating King's Engine example game where we see that a space advantage is converted to a pass pawn. And the pass pawn kind of has immunity from the opponent's king and this kind of nice force field was set up throughout with great penalty anyway. When, when the king was legally allowed to cross the c7, there's great penalties all the time. But the white king proved itself to be superior in the end and causing black's ultimate downfall. So I thought quite a positionally instructive game from Stockfish NN. And to me right now, the Stockfish NN games are just as nice and instructive as the Leela games. Uh, maybe I wouldn't have said that so easily in the past, but it's been really great fun for me personally to watch both of these top engines now. And they're kind of carving up the opposition at the moment, really. Uh, so I, I expect they're going to be battling out in the uh, the super final. I hope you got something from this game annotation. Uh, I've done a new course at Udemy, by the way, King's Crusher TV slash Opening Tango. A lot of research was put into that course. Uh, I'd learned a lot about weakness provocation. I shared that with a lot of other philosophical ideas. So it's not just about the opening there. If you want to check that out, there are some free sample sections to get some of the flavour of it. I hope you check that out. It's got a good rating at the moment, building up students. Uh, there's also the Leela playlist, or and if you want the Stockfish playlist, it's just um, bit.ly slash Stockfish Chess. There's the King's Crusher TV Discord chat. And if you want to challenge me at Chess World, bit.ly slash Chess World, just register there, and I'll be able to invite you for a game after. Comments, questions, like, share, subscribe with the notification bell. Really appreciated. Thanks very much.